California's Sunnyvale Naval Air Station was designed with lessons learned from the many years of experience handling the large rigid airships. A single standard gauge railroad circle had been laid out to allow an airship to approach on any heading. Two additional standard railroad tracks, 65 feet apart, penetrated the circle and led to the hangar. The mooring mast was positioned at circle center. The landing procedure would begin by lighting a smoke candle, which allowed the dirigible crew to determine the wind direction while still at a great distance. Ship's water ballast was pumped forward. Approaching the circle into the wind, the airship crossed the rails at about 220 feet of altitude, traveling about 10 miles an hour. The bow hatches were released and their two yaw ropes uncoiled to land near the bow party below. Line handlers quickly joined them to ropes laid out athwartship from the winch cars positioned at right angles on the circular track. By tightening up both port and starboard lines, the airship's nose was kept into the wind. As winds shifted, the self-powered yaw winch cars could quickly be repositioned anywhere around the endless rail circle that was 874 feet in diameter. Once the yaw lines were taut, the main mooring cable was paid out from the ship. Respectfully waiting for the airship's strong electrical buildup to discharge by touching ground, the bow party used a link to couple the airship's cable to the laid out mooring mass wire rope. The two yaw winch cars and the mass winch all took up the line simultaneously, drawing the airship to the mast while the yaw cars continued to adjust for wind shifts. Props 7 and 8 turned for upward thrust if necessary. Off-duty crew were moved up to add weight to the bow centerline gangway. The mast's cup, left at its normal 75-foot height, passed the winch cable through as the ship's plumb bob-like mooring spindle entered the mast's flexible mount cone. This ensured the airship's tail was kept high out of harm's way. With the bow locked into the cup, the yaw lines were disconnected and retracted. Attention then shifted to the stern handling party. Spider lines, whose design allowed many men to grab toggles, were let down from main ring 35, joint 9. The aft handling party distributed the toggles and spread their lines outboard both port and starboard as mooring officer directed them to be mindful of wind shifts. A riding out car could be used if the ship was only to be resupplied and quickly relaunched. At Sunnyvale, it became standard practice to recover and launch directly from the stern beam. Invented by Navy Lieutenant Calvin Bolster, the first stern beam was built at Lakehurst. The Sunnyvale stern beam was self-propelled and its internal engines powered its windlass set. Nicknamed the Bolster Beam for its inventor, it was 185 feet long. The airship's stern was carefully drawn down and locked onto the beam, which at all times rode the circular track in accordance with the wind. Mooring cables and preventers were quickly rigged to spread the load across pulleys with their lines connected to several reinforced points in the airship's structure. The flying weight fin structure was then reinforced with strong backs. Raised up with pulleys to interface with the main ring 17.5, the X frames attached to two points on the fin by crewmen inside. The weak point, of course, was the airship itself. In one attempt to undock the ZRS 4 in a strong crosshanger wind, the airship's aft fittings failed. The wind carried the stern off the beam and damaged the lower fin against the ground. At Sunnyvale, the hangar had been laid out with the prevailing winds. Thus secured and no longer at the mercy of the wind, the beam began its journey around the track to bring the ship into line with the docking rails. The beam rode on the standard width track atop 33 inch diameter wheels until lined up with the twin rail lines leading back to the hangar. Once the beam's secondary dollies were aligned, its straight set of rail wheels was lowered onto the docking tracks. Then, a long train of rigid steel pipes, called spreader gear, was extended with turnbuckles to fasten firmly to the beam. This rigid steel backbone carried the load of the 89-ton beam, so the ship structure was not strained. The spreader pipe sections themselves rode on small rail wheels atop the straight tracks. At Lakehurst, the beam was hauled into position by a Porter 7402 mine locomotive. The stern beam's circular track wheels were retracted, its tonnage now firmly atop the double straight tracks. 
At that point, the massive mooring mass, controlled from its glass-enclosed cabin, began moving the entire assembly toward the hangar. The system carried the airship in or out of the hangar by either pulling or pushing the spreader gear and stern beam. The system protected its airship during every evolution. Built by Wellman Engineering, the pyramid-shaped mooring mast measured 80 feet on a side. Like its near twin at Lakehurst, the mast rode on four standard gauge wheel trucks. These motion picture recordings were largely directed by Lieutenant Commander Ronald Mayer. Most of the official U.S. Navy footage was shot and originally edited by Chief Photographer's Mate George Carroll.